we're going to change things a little bit. I'm going to suggest you just stay seated for the whole service today. I didn't tell Peter that, so he printed a lot of asterisks telling you to stand up, but just stay seated. When it comes to the hymns, we're going to, Judy's going to play two verses. I invite you to look in the hymnal, follow along the words, hum if you want to, but please try not to sing. That'll be hard because these are good hymns, but we'll do our best. I'm afraid I have to stand up for 439. Okay. It's our national anthem. Okay. <laughs> Never disagree with Bob. Um, and does everybody have your communion elements? Anybody forget to pick it up in the back? I had a hunch, so we'll just go ahead and. Now, if you would, please join with me in the call to worship. With what shall we come before the Holy One and bow ourselves before God on high? Shall we come before God for our offerings and the year old? God has showed you, O people, what is good, and what does the Holy One require of you? To do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. God be with you. sinless we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth if we confess our sins we may trust God to forgive us and love us in his grace let us pray together have mercy on us O God according to your steadfast love according to your abundant mercy blot out our transgressions wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore us joy of your salvation. 
salvation, and uphold us with a willing spirit. Amen. A little later in this service, we're going to hear the hymn, God of Grace and Glory. We do come here today to worship a God of grace, a God of second, third, and fourth chances. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The bulletin now calls for an expression of peace. In a different time, we would have all stood up and reached over and shook each other's hand and said, the peace of Christ be with you. It's not that time. But I invite you to turn to somebody around you and bow. Peace of Christ be with you. We acknowledge each other's presence and our love for each other. Thanks. Uh, the epistle lesson is from Romans 12 verses 9 to 18. Don't just pretend that you love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Stand on the side of the good. Love each other with brotherly affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Be glad for all God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble and prayerful always. When God's children are in need, you be the one to help them out and get into the habit of inviting guests home for dinner or if they need lodging for the night. If someone mistreats you because you are a Christian, don't curse him. Pray that God will bless them. When others are happy, be happy with them. If they are sad, share their sorrow. Work happily together. Don't try to act big. Don't try to get into the good graces of important people, but enjoy the company of ordinary folks. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil for evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honest clear through. Don't quarrel with anyone. Be at peace with everyone, just as much as possible. And the New Testament reading is Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 27. When he returned to the house where he was staying, the crowds began to gather again, and soon it was so full of visitors that he couldn't even find time to eat. When his friends heard what was happening, they came to try to take him home with him. He's out of his mind, they said. But the Jewish teachers of religion who had arrived from Jerusalem said, his trouble is that he's possessed by Satan, king of demons. That's why demons obey him. Jesus summoned these men and asked them, using Proverbs they all understood. How can Satan cast out Satan? A kingdom divided against itself will collapse. A home filled with strife and division destroys itself. And if Satan is fighting against himself, how can he accomplish anything? He would never survive. Satan must be bound before his demons are cast out, just as a strong man must be tied up before his home can be ransacked and his proper property robbed. Here ends the reading. This is the word of the Lord.
everybody notice the front of the bulletin? Yeah. I would suggest to you that Peter, who had a lot to do with figuring out what today's text would be, enjoyed putting that picture there. And I think it speaks to us right now. I, I did uh, talk, email back and forth with Peter this week, and I said, did you pick this parable for this Sunday because it was the Sunday before the election? I said, well, I might have. Um, the passage starts, and, and actually, if you read my version of the Bible, it starts with uh, some name calling. Imagine that, name calling. It begins with uh, the people saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. Fortunately, the footnote tells me that Beelzebul was a pagan god that worshiped Satan. So early on, the people said about Jesus, hey, he's following Satan. I think that qualifies as name calling. And it suggests to me that not just this election, but people have been calling each other names for a long time. I, uh, I have a friend, golfing buddy, he used to be my neighbor 20 years ago, and he came back to this area a couple months ago and we went out and played golf. And uh, Johnny's a retired Philadelphia policeman, a longtime union member, and he told me that uh, he couldn't vote for Joe Biden because he's a socialist. And I said nothing and hit a bad golf shot about three or four holes later. Johnny said to me, you know, I'm Catholic. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, I don't like the Pope either. <laughs> so why not? Well, he's a socialist. And I just thought to myself, Johnny, I'm not going to argue with you in the middle of a golf round, but I'm not so sure you really know what a socialist is. And I've been dying for somebody to say what we used to say on the playground 60 years ago. Remember when you were a kid and somebody would call you a name and you would say, I know you are, but what am I? You try to turn it around. It was all kind of a crazy time. Jesus responded to that name calling with a proverb. The kingdom divided cannot stand. I know it's true about churches. When churches get divided, that's about the end. But I think it's also true about nations and kingdoms and maybe even families. And I know that we're stronger together than we are apart, but boy, it feels like we're really divided right now, doesn't it? And I know a little bit about how things happen because I've been just about every possible political persuasion. I grew up in central Ohio in a family where my parents were Republican and Presbyterian. Can you imagine that? So I went to a Presbyterian seminary in Chicago. 1975 was a big year for me. I got married, I moved to Chicago, I went to a Presbyterian seminary, and in the south side of Chicago, I voted independent, and I was proud of it. And then it snowed. Did you ever hear of a guy named Mayor Richard Daly? He had a bit of a machine going in Chicago, and it was a Democratic machine, and. You know, I grew up Presbyterian and Republican, and I couldn't support that, so I voted independent, and so did a lot of other folks around me, because I was at the University of Chicago, actually where Barack Obama lives now, that neighborhood. And you know what happened? Our ward was independent, and we were proud of it. And then it snowed, and it got really cold. Like 15 degrees below zero, your car won't start cold. cold. And it snowed some more, and I discovered what it meant to be independent in a city where there's a democratic machine. They still plow your streets, and they still pick up your garbage. They just do you last. And you're stuck saying, are they ever going to come down my street? So a year later, another election came about, and you know what that proud Presbyterian Republican did? I voted for the Democrats because I wanted to get my street plowed. Time goes on. We moved from there to the West Coast. For some reason, I didn't like the Presbyterian Church we joined. I decided not to be a pastor. And we wandered around in the wilderness and found the United Church of Christ Church. And my wife became best friends with the young lady who was the pastor, and we've been UCC ever since. But we stayed in that Republican Party, sort of. 
Move back to Limerick. You all know where Limerick is? Mm -hmm. Well, from 1990 to 1995, I was a township supervisor in Limerick, Pennsylvania. The Republican Party came to me. I was the chairman of the Planning Commission, and they said, Dave, we'd like you to run for supervisor, and we'll endorse you, and we'll make sure you get elected. <laughs> so I agreed to do it. I have, was thinking about it driving out here this morning. I have memories of pounding signs along Ridge Pike and Limerick that said, Acres for Supervisor thinking to myself, this has got to be the dumbest thing I have ever done. <laughs> and after the election, I burnt all those signs in a big bonfire. Because I swore I was never going to use them again. I actually, when I first decided to run, I was told there would be no opponent. But that's not quite how it works. The Democrats found an opponent. He was a guy who had been the township maintenance man. And the township had let him go, so he was unemployed. And I guess he thought being a township supervisor was better than nothing. But then about a month before the election, he got a job working the second shift. So the reality was, as he said in the paper, it's kind of a shame that if I do get elected, I can't do the job because I, I won't be able to go to the meetings. So I won that election. I got about 55% of the vote, and he got about 45%. And that was the beginning of my education that said, we vote for our party, period. If I'm a Democrat, I vote for the Democrat. If I'm a Republican, I vote for the Republican. Five years later, I had been promoted a couple times by an insurance company and was traveling all over the United States and said, that's it. I can't make the meetings anymore. I have to resign. And I said to myself, all I'm going to do from now on is write thank you letters to anybody that serves in public office. Because I know how thankless that job is and how miserable it can be. And I know what it's like to be standing at an ATM machine in the grocery store and have people come up and say, hey Dave, we need you to do something. And you think, well, can I finish my ATM trend? Anyhow, you get the idea. We moved out to the West Coast again. I had retired from the insurance world and I took up mentoring people who got out of jail. And I had a friend named Daniel who used to say to me, you're just a Republican. And in Daniel's mind, Daniel was Hispanic. I looked like a Republican. I guess because I paid for lunch most of the time. So I'm white and I got money, so I must be. And I used to say to him, Daniel, I'm a recovering Republican. <coughs> but English was not Daniel's first language. One day, we had lunch, and I said to him, you know, there's this guy named Barack Obama running for president, and I like him a lot. I'd like to get one of his signs from my front yard. And Daniel said, well, I know where the place is. Come on, we'll go. So he jumped in my car, and we went over there. Daniel's quite the character. We walked into the middle of the Obama headquarters, and Daniel hollers out to everybody, hey, everybody, this is David. He's my retarded Republican friend. <laughs> Now, I don't, if you're Republican, I'm not, Republicans are not retarded. I am. And that's kind of the point. Um, anyhow, we moved back here, and I don't want to have anything to do with politics, but I did read a book this week, a couple weeks ago, actually. I just finished it called The Upswing. Interesting book. Do anybody remember there was a book about 10 years ago called Bowling Alone? And the gist of it was the suggestion that Americans have changed. We used to join clubs and teams, and now we do everything alone. And it really feels that way to me during this pandemic. We do everything alone on our computer. And well, the Upswing did a study of America for the last 125 years. And what they found was 125 years ago, what was called the Gilded Age. There was tremendous economic inequality in our country. People were left on their own. There wasn't a lot of cooperation. And for the next 50 or 60 years, we went from the I, I, I to eventually, after the Depression, after World War II, to the 50s and 60s, when there was a lot of we and a lot of growth and a lot of taking care of each other. And since then, for the last 60 years, we've gone the other direction. So we're back to the I, I, I phase of life. And it suggested, and this is the one line in the book that I ask you to reflect on this week, 
It said that we are more divided today over politics than over religion or race. And that's saying something, because we've been divided over religion and race forever and ever and ever. But today it's politics, and the politics divides families. Anybody have family members that don't agree with you politically? I have a, a brother-in-law who's going to vote for somebody other than who I voted for this year. And he posted a thing on Facebook that said, uh, you have to vote for the candidate who's against abortion. It's the only issue that matters. And he, he attached to it a video from a Catholic priest preaching about the uh, election. And my son, the math professor, who hasn't been inside a church in 20 years, took a little offense at that Facebook posting and posted back his own comment and said to his uncle, hey, Uncle Scott, if you got any questions, talk to my dad. He's a minister too. Well, thank goodness I haven't heard from Uncle Scott. <laughs> but um, I know how much families are divided over this election. And it struck me as I thought about it this week, there's a story I've been telling for a long time. It appeared in Guidepost magazine in 1965. A story called the Tarnished Tea Set. A family that had a sterling silver tea set that had been passed down for five generations until Florence and Ralph were growing up together. Florence was the older of the two children. She used to see that tarnished tea set, it wasn't always tarnished, but the tea set in her dining room. And she dreamt about the day, A, when she would be old enough to have tea parties and use that tea set, and B, she knew she would inherit it because she was the older of the two kids. Well, she grew up, she went to college, her brother went to college, her brother went to work for the phone company. She went to work as an interior decorator. World War II came along, they both joined up in the service. She got busy first taking care of her dad who got sick and then taking care of her mom who got sick while her brother went off and got married and had a couple of kids. And then one day, she still lived in the family home. After her mom's funeral, she was away in another city for the day. When she came home, she discovered that somebody had been inside her house and taken several things, including that tea set. It always had sat there on the buffet in the dining room and it was gone. She ran next door and the, the neighbor said, we better call the police. So she called the police and then she called her brother and her brother said, relax. My wife went over there today and just grabbed a few things from the family home. And she said, the tea set? And he didn't say anything. The tea set had been the most important thing she wanted to inherit. And it was now at her brother's house. She waited a couple of weeks and went over there and she was sure she could convince her brother that she should be the one to inherit that tea set. And they argued louder and more ugly than they ever had, so much that the children had to go upstairs. And she went home without that tea set. In the middle of the argument, her brother said, I have to be the one that takes the tea set. I'm gonna be the one that passes it on to my children. And Florence said, what about the children I might have someday? And her brother laughed at her. Kind of a cruel laugh. Well, she tried to get over it. And about six months later, she moved to Chicago, 100 miles away. And for the next 12 years, she had no contact with her brother and his family. But she had a lot of thoughts about how she hadn't been treated fairly, about how it was her tea set that she should be having it. She actually had the buffet from her old dining room and she kept it cleared of anything. She never put anything on it as a reminder that that's where that tea set belonged. She knew she was right. She knew she was justified. She also knew she was lonely. And one day she got that phone call, not from her brother, but from her brother's wife, well now widow, who called to say, Florence, we want you to come home. Ralph passed away suddenly of a sudden heart attack. And Florence said, no, I won't come. 
And she prayed about it and she thought about it. So she did go home for the funeral. She wouldn't stay with her sister-in-law. That would be too much. She checked into a hotel. In the morning of the funeral, she went to the funeral home, sat quietly by herself as people started to come in. At one point she looked over and she saw that it was her sister coming in with two teenage children. Twelve years is a long time in children's lives. She didn't recognize them. They looked all grown up. For a minute she thought they were going to come and sit with her. But they didn't. They went and sat on the other side by themselves. And Florence started to cry. She cried for herself. She cried for twelve years of loneliness. And as the preacher started to do the service. She started to cry for her brother. And finally, about halfway through the service, she stood up, she moved over and sat down with her sister-in-law and her niece and nephew. And she thought to herself, Jesus didn't tell us to love the possessions. He didn't tell us to love the tea set. He didn't tell us to only love people when we're right said love each other period and that's kind of my message as we look at this time in our lives and we're all divided life is short and there's really shouldn't be anything that divides us having said that I'm going to close with a I don't know if it's a poem or just a writing from Richard Rohr about being divided he suggests there's one way we should be divided. He says, humanity, you are all one. You are one beloved community and you are one global sickness. And you are all contagious and you always have been, unconsciously of infecting and yet able to also bless one another. There are no higher and lower in this world there is no smart or stupid, no totally right or totally wrong. The only meaningful division is between those who serve and those who allow themselves to be served. We are all in elementary school now. Here we must learn to stand in two different places and to change places often. The served must also be the servants and the servants must also be the servant. Just stay in the internal circle of the suffering and the servants. Christians call it the body of Christ. But we are all members of that body, all called to love each other and care for each other, and to follow the ways of Jesus, who teaches us to love, or as Paul says in his letter, to live peaceably with all and to care for each other. As we prepare for communion, listen to the tune from God of Grace and Glory.
as we get ready to pray, what joys and concerns are on your heart today? God, we bow our heads and we lift our hearts to you, giving thanks for all the many blessings you've given us, lifting up to you those who've lost loved ones, be with them and comfort them and help them to feel your love. We pray, O oh Lord, for our country, for the election that's coming up. We pray for peace, for respect, and for wisdom. We pray that our leaders might lead, and that we might remember to respect each other at all times. We pray, O oh Lord, for this world, for all who are suffering from the pandemic, pray that those of us who have not been greatly affected can remember and care for those who've lost their jobs. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless us as we seek to care for others, that you would bless the food that's gathered, that all those in the pantries might feel our love and our concern for them. Bless this church we gather here in the sanctuary again for the first time in a long time and be with each of us as we seek to follow in the ways of Jesus Christ. For we gather here today as disciples of Jesus and so we join together in the prayer that he taught his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, in case you all haven't noticed, Sometimes I'm up here saying, I wonder what I'm supposed to do next. The bulletin says I'm supposed to do the offering. It's our first time back here. So I'm going to go back there and grab the plate. Does anybody need me to stop by you on the way by, or can I just bring it forward? I'm going to go for it.
thanksgiving as it's written in the bulletin. Bless, O oh God, these are our gifts. And bless our desire to participate with you in the building of your realm among us. Accept these gifts as a sign of our love for you and for our neighbors. gather at this table and remember how on the night when Jesus was handed over, he gathered his disciples in the upper room and they shared in an ordinary meal that has extraordinary implications. For at this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with the ones who betrayed him. At the table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with the one who denied him. At this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with those who fled from him at his time of need. At this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with people of all walks of life. And so, whenever we gather at this table to share the bread and the cup in the community of faith, we proclaim Jesus' life, which affirms that there is a place at this table for all people. For the love of God transcends every power that tries to contain it. Turn in your bulletin with me. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift thanks, thanks to God. God. Let us give thanks to God most high. Let us give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you and bless you for creation and for the gift of life and for your abiding love, which brings us close to you, the source of all blessings. We thank you for the revealing of your will for us in the giving of the law and in the preaching of the prophets. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came that we might have life and have it abundantly. We celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to gather your church, by which your work may be done in the world, and through which we share the gift of faith with the faithful people in every time and place we praise with joy your holy name. Amen.
Through the bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ gives. The gifts of God for the people of God come for all things are ready. The body of Christ, the living bread, take and eat. Cup of salvation, drink of it, all of it. If you would please turn to your bulletin for the prayer of thanksgiving, and let's pray together. Almighty God. We give thanks for the Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of His holy name. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ our Redeemer, One more thing to today's worship service. In many churches, this is considered All Saints Day, and we remember those who we've lost in the last year. So I would invite you to lift up the names of any that we've lost in the last year. John Wersom, my brother-in-law. Okay, John. Greg Boder. Gary Picard. Roxana Scott. Sean Connery. We have Pastor Gene. Pastor Gene. Jim Baird. Richard Greer. Donna. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Great God, we bow our heads and we lift our hearts to you, giving thanks for all the saints, the ones who've touched our lives, the ones whose names we've mentioned, the ones who meant still very much to us. Bless them, O Lord, as we've been blessed by their lives and their presence with us. For we give you thanks for the many gifts you give us, especially these saints. And we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
peace. To serve and to be served and change places often. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us all, now and world without end. Amen. Amen.